All right, so uh, have you guys ever had a moment just kind of toying off of what we just kind of walked into? Have you ever had a moment where you felt maybe disappointed in God? Anybody besides me? Yeah, a couple people? Good. Good to know there's some people telling the truth tonight. Good. Um, have you ever had an, an answered prayer um, or maybe a prayer that has not been answered and you started to maybe question and wonder why? Me? Anybody else? Yeah, a couple other people? Good. We're getting more honest as the night goes. Um, have you guys ever maybe questioned your faith and maybe considered, is this thing real? Because if it's real, why would God, a good God, in fact, allow for bad things to happen to me, a good person? Anybody? Maybe you're in the room here tonight and you've been sitting in this spot because you were promised something as a kid. Or maybe you said, um, man, I'm I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be in Beaumont. I'm going to be married. I'm going to have kids by the time I'm 30. And you're 27 and you're single. And you're like, all right, God, funny jokes. Yeah, coming at some of you guys. It's okay. Uh, Maybe you're in the room. And, uh, and you're grieving, right? Like you, you've lost something. Maybe you got fired or you've got let and go from a job. And uh, you, you've been the faithful person, right? Like you showed up to work every single day. Or maybe you showed up to the classroom. And, and yet the, the teacher's still kind of poking at you a little bit. Maybe you just graduated from high school or college. And you've moved here. And you're looking for your next step. But it feels like everything around you is against you. You've, you've yet to find that job or you've yet to find that community or you've yet to find that, that spouse. And so you feel like maybe God owed you something because you did the right thing, right? I came to PYA on Tuesday. I got in a small group. I showed up and I did my part. And so maybe that answered prayer is still yet to happen. Or maybe, maybe you're at a place in your life where if you're honest with yourself, it's a really dark and lonely spot where uh, you got broken up with and uh, you, you had a lot of identity or you had a lot of time or money invested into a relationship and now it's no longer there. Maybe it's a friend group. Maybe it's um, a career change. Maybe you, you had someone in your life who was your best friend and they're no longer here. It'd be really easy to maybe question and ask that. And the place that you run to next is so much easier for you to go lay in your bed and watch Netflix because that's the place that makes you feel the most comfortable. Or maybe you're... Um, You're so over everything that's happening in your life right now that the only thing that you can focus on is going to the next adventure or the next place, and that's a one-way ticket to the Caribbean where you don't have to see anybody. You don't want to have a cell phone anymore. You want to delete social media. And the only thing you want to do is just wear linen and sunglasses, right? You just want to play tennis all day. It sounds a little specific. That's me, if I'm honest. It's literally like what I wish I could do a lot of the times. But I know that for a lot of you guys, you're probably sitting in here in this room, and that's not your story, right? Everything is roses. I know we got people getting ready to have kids. We got, we got people that are coming here, and they're about to get married in the next little bit. We've got people that have come in here, and they just got promoted. Like, there's, there's different levels to this. But I do know for the majority, or maybe even the most of us, or even if it is the minority, things aren't peachy right now. Things don't feel good right now. You're mad at God. You're frustrated at people. And you're asking yourself, why is this happening to me? And now you're faced with coming to terms with reality versus what you thought life was going to look like. And the problem is, is that when we have the intention or the expectation, oftentimes it meets or it, it looks very different than reality. And so we start getting a little frustrated or we start maybe uh, retreating or or pulling away from something. 
See, there's a, there's a guy, which I'm sure probably many of you guys have heard the story of Job. And inside the book of Job, there's so many different things that are happening in this guy's life. And it's 42 chapters. So if you have not read it, uh, I would encourage you to walk through that book. Uh, it's challenging. It's pushing. And it, uh, it will propel you and move your faith. If you have heard the story, uh, then you understand this, that you know that Job is a guy who was blameless. Uh, he was righteous. Uh, he was one who was one of wealth. He was a guy who kind of had it all. And inside the story tonight, what we're going to do is we're going to sit in maybe four or five different parts of scripture that I believe that for whoever it is that's walking through the season of life right now that's saying, man, I don't understand how I'm going to get through it, Darian. No, no, no. You don't understand if you knew the pain, you knew the hurt that I was going through or what these people or what this relationship or what this group did to me or that job or that expectation versus the reality, then you wouldn't even be able to utter the words. And I will be honest with you. I don't, I don't know. But when I look at scripture, Job's life, it really points out a different perspective for me that says, I know a lot of you guys in this room and I don't know if it's as bad as Job. And Job's response here is like, it's faith building. So tonight as we go through it, so if you've got your Bible, if you've got your phone, if you've got a notebook, we're going to sit in Job and we're going to walk through about 42 chapters and about 23 minutes. So stick with me here. No, I'm messing. Uh, well, kind of. Anyways, so... Uh, like I said, I'm going to give you guys some quick little like outline bullet points for a lot of you guys that have never heard it, or maybe some of you guys that have heard it. So uh, Job, like I said, wealthy, blameless, upright guy. He's lived in the city of Uz. Uh, and so in this, in this time period of time, a lot of the things that are taking place, uh, Job looks like the uh, wealthy honcho guy and everybody kind of wants to be like him, right? He's got family, he's got kids. He's kind of got this life made out for him. So in this process, uh, Satan is challenging God because he wants, to, uh, he wants to test and see if Job's faith is great. Job's words uh, are that he believes, in God's all day, he believes in God all day long, and Jesus or God is sitting here saying, hey, you know what? I'm going to uh, allow for Satan to test my good friend Job because if he is this guy who says that he loves you so much, then let's see how he responds. So God allows for this to happen. I know it's pretty wicked. I don't understand, but this is the way the scripture says it. So he allows for, for, for Satan to uh, ruin him, but he can do everything except for kill him. So what he does is he literally makes his life a living hell. He kills his kids. He puts boils and scars all over him. He rids him of all his money. Uh, he, he's got no family He's literally alone. Everything that he's worked for his entire life in a snap of a finger has been gone. Now, his response here is probably very similar to a lot of you guys. What would he be doing or what would he be saying? Well, he gets really upset, obviously. And so he goes for about seven days or so. And then he gets to a spot or a place where he says, hey, you know what? I need to talk to some of my friends. Well, his friends allow him to kind of convene and maybe get a little angry or get a little sad. He's anxious at this moment in time. And all of a sudden, his friends are like, all right, bro, listen, we know that you're upset, but it's time for you to start trying to get over it. So he's got three buddies. His buddies start giving him some advice. Essentially, they're just gaslighting him at this point. Like, they're just kind of making him feel like uh, everything he's saying doesn't have any weight to it. And so now Job is left with this tension and this tug and this pull of what reality and what the expectation is. So as he's sitting here, Job is, is now starting to ask and answer, I'm sorry, to answer questions in his own head of trying to figure out who God is and why God would allow the person who said that he is upright, holy, and righteous, and a man following after his heart, why would he allow for these things to happen? And I don't know if if I'm honest, if scripture gives us a clear reason to why this suffering takes place in his life. It's easy for us to assume that it's to build our faith, but I don't know in even studying it that there's a clear reason. And so if you're here in this room today, I don't have a clear reason for you of why you are suffering and why you are going through the things that you're going through. I have a lot of hope and I have a lot of faith. And I believe that God works all things for good. And just as he did in Job's life, as he was faithful, he will be faithful in yours. 
And so at this point in his life, uh, as his wife is getting ready to kind of encourage him uh, to maybe walk away from his faith, she literally says, hey, if you denounce God, everything will get better. And so maybe you feel like that, is that I've been trying to do it the right way. I've been coming to the small group. I've been coming to the service. I've been serving on the team. But you know what? I did it the way my parents said it. I did it the way the pastor said it. But it might just be easier if I just go ahead and retreat, walk away from this God thing, and put him on the back burner so that I can do it my own way because I think that I know best. That's what his wife is kind of pushing at at Job to tell him right now. Well, Job refuses. He says, I mean, I I, I can't do that. If if I were to do that, then I would literally die, or I would rather die at that point. So basically, after all this is taking place, Job starts questioning God. At one point, he actually starts saying, God, I need you to meet me face to face. Like, it's almost like they're about to square up with one another. Like, he's like, hey, I need to talk to you face to face. Like he's frustrated. He's mad. Eventually, jumps and he commands uh, 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 God to, to say, hey, if you're real, present yourself. Say something to me because I need answers. So God being God, he comes down and he meets with him. It leads Job to this place where he eventually repents. And in this moment, at the spot where he's absolutely broken, he's completely convinced that his life is over. It's in shambles. There's no way he's going to get out of the mud. There's no helpline. His friends aren't any help. He's got no family. He's got no money. His wife has told him to denounce God. He is starting to question, is God real? Maybe that's you. When he meets God, what, what happens is, is that He repents, and God blesses him tenfold. And I know that may be challenging in our faith because it's like, well, wait a second. You're going to tell me it's going to get worse before things are going to get better? Yeah. You're meaning to tell me that if I keep doing this thing, I might not get the husband or the wife? Yeah. You mean to tell me that I might lose my friends? I might lose my family? Yeah. And you mean to tell me that the only thing that I'm going to be able to do is to literally cry out to God and hope and pray that he meets me somewhere in there? Yeah. And so in Scripture, Job 1, it says this, verse 8. You can put it on the screen for me. It says, And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on this earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put the hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? Basically, he's saying that God, are you, have you not protected him? Have you not, have you not allowed for him for these bad things not to happen? And he says, have you blessed the work of his hand and the possessions have increased in the land? But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will curse you to to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has in your hand, only against him. Do not stretch out your hands. And so Satan went out in the presence of the Lord. And so point one tonight, as I said, we're going to walk through just 42 chapters. I'm going to find small little bits of it uh, to hopefully these would be things in your back pocket and your front packet, or maybe you can apply to your life. That as Job lived this lifestyle that I believe that we might all be able to relate to, here are five things that I believe that we can all hold on to and our faith will build. The first one is God has not forgotten you. I know that's one that we maybe have grown up in hearing our entire lives. But yes, God has not forgotten you because see here in Scripture, as Job is literally sitting here on the other side of it because we know the end of the story, he's asking, why are these things happening? In this point blank period, God is allowing for this to take place. If God is allowing for this to take place, then he cannot have forgotten you. Because he knows, as you said right here, as it says right there, then Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him? This is all of us. And his house and all that he has on every side. You've been blessed the work of his hand and his possessions have increased the land but stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will curse and he will curse you to your face basically he's saying this is things aren't going to work out for him so what i want us to see from this scripture here tonight 
is, is that you might feel forgotten, but remind yourself this, that God is sovereign, God is in control, and even though it doesn't make sense, even though it might be hard to wrap your head around it, God will allow for things to take place into your life so that we can build our faith. But before we can build our faith, it requires a very pure moment that we can see in Scripture that Job walks through. So after he starts questioning, after he starts maybe, maybe uh, uh, challenging his own faith and, and saying, why are these things happening? The anxious, the depression, the anxiety, the fear. Job's next response is he has to get honest before God. And so right after that, in Job 7, it says, and this is like a, this is genuinely, this is an open letter to God. And honesty does build trust. I don't know if you've had a relationship with a friend, or I don't know if you've had a relationship with um, your spouse or whatnot. You do not get anywhere in a relationship without honesty. And so God deserves the honest as well. God deserves the frustration, the worship, the happy, the cheers, and the tears. And so Job's words right here are a very honest, open letter that is to hope, hopefully from here, you find that it is okay for you to be honest with God. Because when you are honest with God, it builds the relationship. It builds the trust. And so in Job 7, it's 21 verses, so hold on here. He says, has not man a hard service on earth and are not his days like the days of a hired hand? Like a slave who longs for the shadow, and like a hired hand who looks for his wages. So I am not allowed months of emptiness, and nights of misery are appointed, are appointed to me. When I lie down, I say, when shall I rise? But the night is long, and I am full of tossing till the dawn. My flesh is clothed with worms and dirt. My skin hardens, then breaks out of a fresh. My days are swifter, and weavers shuttle and come to their end without hope. Remember that my life is a breath. My eye will never again see good. The eye of him who sees me will behold me no more. While your eyes are on me, I shall be gone. As the cloud fades and vanishes, and so who go down to Sheol does not come up. He returns no more to his house, nor does his place know him anymore. Therefore, I will not restrain my mouth. I will speak it I will speak in the anguish of my spirit, and I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. This is so honest. And I am the sea of the sea monster, that you are set a guard over me. When I say my bed will comfort me, my couch will ease with complaint, then you will scare me with dreams and terrify me with visions, so that I would choose strangling and death rather than my bones. I loathe my life. I loathe my life. I would never live forever. Leave me alone, for my days are a breath. What is man that you make so much of him and that you set your heart on him? Visit him every morning and test him with every moment? How long will you not look at me? How long will you not look away from me, nor leave me alone till I swallow my spit? If I sin, what do I do to you, you watcher of mankind? Why have you made your mark? Why have you become a burden to you? Why do you not pardon my transgressions and take away my iniquity? For now I shall lie in the earth and you will seek me, but I shall not be. See, getting honest with God in your moment of grief, it allows for him to meet you in that exact space of emptiness. I don't know of a more honest journal entry that you can write. He's lost everything. He's lost the job. He's lost the relationship. He's lost the family. His skin has boils. He feels empty. But what Job responds here is an open, honest letter saying, God, why are you allowing for this to happen? And God's response here is so incredible, but it took for Job to be honest. It took for Job to say, hey, I'm not doing too hot. I'm straight up not having a good time right now. And unless you do not meet me in this moment, I would rather lay down in the earth. And so I would ask 
that wherever you are at in your life, if you are talking to God or you haven't talked to him in a long time, your best bet is not to fake Christianity and not to tote your Bible around. It's not even best to tweet about it. Your best bet is to get honest with him. Your best bet is to literally cry out to him. And I've said it before. God is God. He can handle it. And he wants it. And he desired it because he's created you. And he, again, has allowed for this situation to come. But our response is very important. Because if we are not honest with God, if we are not honest with God, then I have a really hard time believing that he would want to meet us in the middle of that. God wants and desires a pure and authentic relationship with you. But if you are not honest, just like if you're not honest with your girlfriend or your husband or your job, then you will never grow in relationship with it. And so as Job gear, he gets honest. The intention versus the reality. The expectation, right? The expectation in my life would say, man, if I don't get honest, people won't have to know me. If I don't get honest with God, then he's already going to just pave the way for me. The reality is, if you're not honest with God, then it's really hard to build this relationship with him. It's really hard to take the next step. So our intention might be pure, right? The intention is never anything we think bad. The problem is, is when our intention and the expectation and do not meet, We intend for good things to happen, but it isn't always. The expectation of what we believe God has owed us versus the reality of what God is actually trying to do oftentimes does clash. And so the ideal moments like this, on a hard day, my ideal or my my expectation would be is I'm just going to bounce back. You're not going to bounce back. When you do it on your own, you will not bounce back. When you are honest with God and you rely on God, then you bounce back. And so Job's response is here. At first, he realizes that God has not forgotten me. But then once he starts to question that, he has to get really honest with God. And his next response is that he starts to try and, and find answers. And the answer that he finds is that God is always the answer. God is always in the healing. And so in Job 38, he says, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Let me just preface this real quick for you guys. God's about to give a moment where he's going to check humankind. He checks Job, essentially. And he, he, he gets him in this position where he's like, Oh, you want to be mad at me? Oh, you want the answers? And you think that the answer is going to make everything feel better? It's not. You think if you knew the next step or you think if you knew why this was going to happen, then you would run to me? No. And that challenges the, the mess out of me. Why? Because I so badly have been confused or maybe even lied to by myself and by so many other people that if I got the answer, things would get better. It's not going to happen that way. And so what God does, Job meets him, right? Remember, Job wanted to, he said, hey, God, me and you, we need to have a conversation. And so what God does is he kind of, he says, all right, you want to talk? And these are the words he says. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, who is this, the darkness of the council by, by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man, and I will question you, and you make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? This is God. Tell me if you have an understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what what were its bases sunk? And who laid it at, at its cornerstones? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea of the doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made the clouds and the garment of thick darkness its swaddling bed and prescribed limits for it and set bars and doors and said, thus for all shall you come and no further and here shall you, 
verse 11, sorry, and said, and thus far shall you come and no further. And here shall you pound proud waves and be straight. Have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place? That it might take hold of the skirts of the earth and then the wicked will be shaken out of it? It is changed like clay under the sea and its features stand out like a garment. From the wicked their light is, with, is withheld and their uplifted arm is broken. Have you entered the springs of the sea or walked in the, rec- the, the recesses of the deep? Have you the gates of the death been revealed to you? And have you seen the gates of the deep darkness? Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Declare if you know all of this. God is essentially saying, do you know better than me? Do you know how big the sky is? Were you there when I created it? The answer is no. And so God, with the answers, he says to Job, if you think that knowing and understanding how all of this works is going to make you better or grow your faith, then you've got it twisted. Because I am God. And I know that is challenging for the smartest person in the room or the engineer where A and B and C have to equal D. But that's not how this relationship with God works. And I know that's not encouraging. And I know that's not maybe even helpful for you. But what it is, is it's the truth. Is that God being God gets to allow for things to take place. And he reminds us that wherever you are at, that he has not forgotten you. That when you are honest with him, he will meet you there. And that while you might be looking for the answers in X, Y, and Z, the only answer that you can run to is him. The only place that you can find him is not in the alcohol, it's not in the relationship. Those answers that you're you're striving and saying, if I just knew why this happened, if I could just understand, if I could just get a little more out of this. Then, then I would believe in God. Then I would run closer to him. And Job, who's got every reason in the world to say, man, I can't. His response there is one of healing. Because he tells him, if you want to heal, trust me. You didn't create this, trust me. You can't handle this. Trust me. You don't get to do this. Trust me. And then he gives him his next step in Job 42. And he says, Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me. Which I did not know. And here I will ask. And speak. I will question you. And you make it known to me. I had heard of you. By the hearing of the ear. But now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself, and I repent in dust and ashes. And so Job's next step is repentance. God desires closeness with each one of us. But if we continue to put the block, or put the wall, or put the barricade, in this way of coming to understand God then we are not getting closer to him. And true repentance brings us closer. And so what Job is doing on this moment, after he was angry, after he was hurt, after he questions God, he finds that, you know what, God? I actually don't know. 
I actually can't even comprehend what's happening in my life right now. And so his next step is repentance. And you might be asking yourself, why would I have to repent? God owes me something. I'm expecting God to give me what he promised. And instead, the response that each one of us should have is one of repentance with open hands and saying, God, you are in control. And I am sorry that I even had the idea to fathom this moment. Because God, I know that you have not forgotten me. God, I know, I know that you are for me. And so when we can remember Job's response in this moment of that we are not forgotten, that we can get honest and it builds our relationship with God. And we remind ourselves that the answer is not in people, the answer is not in a thing, the answer is not in something that makes us feel comfort, but the answer is in Jesus. And then we can sit firm in a place of repentance, to say that the only thing that will draw me closer to him is one that says, I want to look more like you. And if I want to look more like you, I've got to die to myself. And so God, remove the things inside of me that make me desire, that make me question, that make me, make me, that make me want to put you on the back burner because I believe that you are not good enough. And then after we get to that moment, we get to walk in the most beautiful step that maybe some of you guys are in right now, or maybe some of you guys are in the complete mud. And you're like, you don't get it, Darian. I'm hurt. But the story goes on. Because in 42, just literally immediately, six or seven verses after the repentance takes place, the blessing comes. And in verse 10, it says, After Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes and gave him twice as much as he had before. All his brothers and sisters and everyone who had known him before came and ate with him at his house. They comforted and consoled him over all the trouble the Lord had brought on him. And each one gave him a piece of silver and a gold ring. And the Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the former part. He got more. And he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke and oxen, and 1,000 donkeys. And he had seven sons and three daughters. His first daughter named Jeremiah, and the second Keziah, and the third Karen. Nowhere in the land where they were found women as beautiful as Job's daughters. And their father granted them an inheritance along with their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years and saw his children and their children to the fourth generation. Suffering is inevitable. And we're all going to go through it. I can promise that. But with the moment that Job's life changed, wasn't the complaining, it wasn't the cry out. Everything changed when he repented. Everything changed when he said, I desire to be closer to you. I desire to look more like you. Everything changed when he said, my desires, my ways need to look like yours. And it was at a moment that everything changed. And I'm not sitting here preaching that the moment that you come to know Jesus or the moment that you just come to know uh, and you want to run closer to God, that you're just going to be guaranteed all these things. Now, you, you probably or you might go through the highs and the lows. But what I do know is that if you wake up every single day and you say, God, I want to look more like you, then every single day, God will continue to be faithful. And God will show up in your mess. 
God will meet you in the middle. God will allow for those things to take place so that we can rely, so that we can have comfort, so that we can, instead of running further from God, we run to him. And in that running to him, in that repentant state, we draw near. And he becomes the helper, the friend that's closer than a brother, the father, the good one. He becomes the one who is faithful, the one who has promises that are yes and amen, the one who says that his mercies are new every morning for you and for me. But it takes an every day surrendering, even in the suffering, even in the grieving, even when the job or the friends or the relationship does not work out. And Job's response is one that I pray and hope that I can try to live out. And I hope and pray that each one of us would have a desire to say, you know what, God? I know you haven't forgotten me. I'm willing and I'm desiring being honest with you. You are the answer. God, I'm willing to repent and I remind myself daily that you will be faithful. Pastor Rag always says that when you're walking through the storm, when you don't know what to do, you just take one step in front of the other. Open hands in the world of a big God, long obedience in the same direction. And so you might not know how to get through the storm. One step in front of the other. You don't understand why the things are happening. One step in front of the other. Let's be a church or a ministry or a small group of people who are committed to long obedience in the same direction. Let something dwell inside of us tonight that says, God, your ways are perfect. And because you are perfect, everything that flows out of you has to be perfect as well. And so this pain, this suffering, this hurt, this, this disgrace, this despair, it has to be perfect. It has to be. And I might not look at it as that way, but I have to remind myself that God does. And he doesn't make mistakes. He is faithful. And he is good yesterday, today, and forevermore. And so as we get ready to respond in this next portion of our service, would you surrender the pain? Would you get honest with God? Would you cry out? Would you believe in one that is sovereign? If it's for the blessing, you know the end of the story. When we are faithful, it is tenfold. If it's an act of repentance to grow closer to God, it's the best thing that we can do. So would you pray with me? God, Lord, your, your ways are higher. Your truth, your word, your scripture is one that we will stand on. One that we will believe and we will hold on to. God, for the ones in here that are grieving, for the ones in here that are walking through the tough season, God, would you nudge them to be so honest with you? God, it's okay to not be okay. You know that. We know that. God, but you don't want us to stay there. And so God, let each one of us tonight take one step, one step closer to you in an act of obedience, 
and an act of repentance. Reminding ourselves that you are in control of our lives today, tomorrow, and forevermore. So in your name we pray, amen.